Lachetti is there. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as we have first this up on the screen, everyone, welcome to ASPMB Journal Club. I am Raj Mukhopadhyay, the science writer with the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. I'm Jeff Hunt. I'm the Society's Public Outreach Coordinator. So ASPMB Journal Club is an interactive feature where we can showcase authors who publish in the journals published by the Society. ASPMB publishes three journals, the Journal of Biological Chemistry, the Journal of Lipid Research, and the subject of today's hangout, molecular and cellular proteomics. So today we have an international contingent of authors, the third one just getting on right now. Um, so I'm just going to have them introduce themselves real quickly. So we'll start here with Angel. Uh, well, well, my name is Sanjil. I'm a, I am a postdoc, you know, uh, researcher working now at University of Vigo. I'm still working on muscles and other marine uh, organisms, you know, evolutionary okay. issues, yeah. David? I, I'm David Skibinski. I'm from the College of Medicine in Swansea University in Wales. And yes, I've been working with muscles for uh, many, many years since I was a graduate student. Great, and then Lefteri, are you there? There, there he is. is. Lefteri, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him quickly. I've got the mic. His mic is on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. in mute. Yeah. Well, it's Lefteri Zeros, and he's at the University of Crete, I believe, and we will get him to introduce himself at a later point. So um, as we go through our discussion, um, please feel free to jump in with questions. You can post them to the Google Plus page that we have up, or you can tweet them at us at ASBMB using the hashtag Journal Club. So okay. I think, Lefteri, have you unmuted yourself? I can hear you, yes. OK, yeah. yes, yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself real, really briefly? Give us your name and where you're located and what you work on. Okay, okay. Uh, Lefteri Zuros, uh, Professor Emeritus of the University of Crete. Uh, yes, um, I started working on the muscles back in the 90s when I was in Canada, uh, in the Dalhousie University in Halifax. And although I do not have an active lab at this moment because I'm retired, I'm still um, collaborating with several teams that work on this subject, and, and I'm, I'm really quite excited about it. Thank you. Great. So as they've all, all our authors have mentioned, the paper that we're going to be talking about today deals with mitochondrial inheritance, but we're using <coughs> muscles, which is a really sort of unique model organism that you don't usually find in research papers. So the first question that we're going to ask, and everybody who's watching can feel free to ask questions as well, like Raj says, uh, we'll just get the discussion started and ask, you know, why study mitochondrial DNA inheritance using muscles? Uh, so, Lefteri, let's, let's start with you. How did okay. you get started doing this? Okay, well, um, accidentally, really, uh, I was uh, looking at um, genetic markers to differentiate between populations of muscles um, at different um, geographic areas around Nova Scotia, and in the process, um, I found that nothing made sense uh, because it, this, the picture was too complicated, and we decided really to find it to to make crosses uh, between individuals of muscles and follow the inheritance of the mitochondrial DNA. And in the process, we found that um, uh, about half of the offspring uh, had mitochondrial DNA from the father. Uh, I should say that um, there was also about well, about the same time, there were article, articles from several people, mainly from Skibinski's lab, which suggested that there is an extended heteroplasmy. Uh, so we knew that something strange was going on. And um, then from this process, it turned out, in fact, that, um, yes, there was a very peculiar system of uh, two mitochondrial DNAs inherited or carried out by the same individual, namely by males, males having mitochondrial DNA from the mother and the father, and females having only from the mother. So it was um, a very interesting case, and we started following it up since then. Because really, you, ne you never find this thing happening, that is, that you can have a regular and compulsory system of inheritance of two mitochondrial DNAs. I think this is unique. 
then that uh, started us going. So, David, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just, I mean, as Left Terry said, I was working on mitochondrial DNA in muscles at the same time. And the reason why I started on it was that at that time I was a population geneticist working with protein variation, starch gel electrophoresis, a popular technique in the 70s, 80s. And I, I, I decided I would like to do something different. And there was a growing literature on mitochondrial DNA, so I decided to have a shot at um, isolate, isolating mitochondrial DNA from muscles, just just as an experiment, out of curiosity, really. And um, well, in those days, of course, there was no PCR, and you had to extract all the mitochondrial DNA. And the best source of mitochondrial DNA is eggs, really, and so we used um, gonadal tissue from females. And um, by doing that, of course, initially, we missed completely um, the observation that males have a, a separate mitochondrial DNA molecule. It was only later, Lefteria started to explain his evidence, only later that it became apparent that when you looked at males and females, the males were heteroplasmic, but the females generally were not. And so, of course, so what do you mean by heteroplasmic? Could you just explain that term, please? Yes. Well, this, this, this is really that um, individuals often have one type of mitochondrial DNA they inherited from the mother in standard um, mitochondrial right. DNA inheritance. And heteroplasmy simply means that you've got um, more than one type of mitochondrial DNA. And okay. this this happens in humans as well. Humans can be heteroplasmic, and often this is a cause of genetic diseases. One of their one type of mitochondrial they have is is mutated, and this can cause various conditions. So this occurs in this was observed in a wide variety of organisms at that time. is still observed frequently. So I mean, the big question is why why are individual why don't individuals just have one type of mitochondrial DNA? Why do they have several? Great. So, so let's talk a little bit about muscles. I know Angel has sort of the hands-on experience now. You know, how did you get involved with this, Angel? And sort of, how is it that you work with muscles in a laboratory setting? Well, yeah. Well, to be honest, you know, uh, at the time that were uh, w uh, in, at that time that uh, when I was, you know, doing, you know, my PhD work, well, I worked with muscles as well. And then, you know, after I completed my PhD, you know, I started to work with muscles with, well, in the in the Professor Eskiminski labs, and you know, I started to uh, to do some proteomics work. And to be honest, uh, I knew, you know, the work that David Dees, uh, did, you know, and, and Professor Soros as well. So for me, you know, it, it was a pleasure, you know, to start, you know, this kind of work uh, uh, with 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 Professor Eskivinsky and, and Lefteri. So and especially, you know, uh, studying, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, this uh, new um, um, peculiar, you know, uh, inherited mechanisms of the mitochondrial DNA. So well, it, you know, that that was uh, uh, the point for the starting point for me. You know, well, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the, my my postdoc, you know, started in the Professor Eskivinsky lab. So I started to to do this kind of works. You know mostly related with the proteomics. Yeah. So so while reading your paper, um, the obvious question was, how do you work with muscles? How do you tell females apart from males, and how do you keep a, muscles in a lab? Well, you know, first of all, <laughs> of course, we, we, we need to uh, do the sampling, you know. Uh, well, you know, sometimes, well, depending on the weather, you know, sampling muscles is not too complicated, but for example, you know, yesterday I was, uh, you know, by, just by, by chance, you know, I, 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 I was sampling, you know, muscles, and you know, the weather was not not very good, so with you know, sand waves, and um, but but in the end, you know, we, we we need to collect, you know, the muscles from the wild. Then, you know, we need to bring with us to the, uh, you know, a marine station with the special, you know, facilities to keep, you know, and um, grow, you know, the the, the muscles there. So. Um, well, it's a matter of experience and, and, and time, you know, uh, and, and to get, you know, the proper facilities. But in the end, well, you can uh, easily, you know, induce, you know, muscles to spawn and then uh, uh, making, you know, controlled crosses, you know, and 
again, get, you know, the progeny and, you know, study some features of that progeny. In terms of sexing, well, it's, well, when you get, you know, the, the, the muscle spawns, you easily can distinguish between eggs and sperm, so you can easily determ determine, you know, the muscles if they are female or males. So, so that's, you know. Cool. Okay. So, got a picture of what it looks like. <laughs> the muscles there. A lot of muscles uh, there. Yes, a lot of muscles, yes. A lot of muscles, <laughs> exactly. And so one of the one of your co-authors, uh, Ellen, who isn't able to join us today, yeah. uh, goes out and gets these in, in Nova Scotia as well. Um, I think... Oh, yeah. and Hell's actually showing us a like, yeah, muscle well, shell. Yeah, that's a muscle shell, so... Uh. Huh. <laughs> so if you... Uh, all right. So we, we got to look at the muscles. Let's talk a little bit about sort of what what you're looking for. You you have the muscles. You, you sex them out. You know what what's sort of the experimental procedure that you went through in this paper? What was the hypothesis going in, and what was sort of the the results that you got? And you know why did you use it as a proteomics approach? So whoever wants to take that one. <laughs> yeah, you want. Uh, well, David, for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. In in this case, yeah. Ty, uh, if you want to look at the experimental design, we can just explain. Um, this the sex bias muscles from natural population. If you get that up. Sure, we will. Let me. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> one second. So you can. David, you can start talking while we pull up the slides. Yeah. Yes, so it, I was going to say it could be. It could be while you while you get that. It could be useful just to flip back to one of Lefteri's one of Alan and Lefteri's photographs, the green one, and Lefteri could perhaps explain the difference between that one, uh, between the, the, the dispersed and aggregated embryo types. Yeah. All right. Um, yes, I can see the, the slide. So um, let me go back a bit and see how I really, and I think all of us, look at this. Um, uh, we should go back and remember, remind people that uh, mitochondrial DNA is inherited only through the mother. So it's, it seems that uh, if a mitochondrial DNA molecule is in the male, it's really destined to disappear. And you may think of, will there be a way that the mitochondrial DNA of the male, the male mitochondrial DNA, should kind of uh, overcome this? or undermine this uh, dominance of the female mitochondrial DNA and, and be inherited itself too. So there should be a way of doing this in, in muscles and probably this is the only way that, the only case that we know that the male mitochondrial DNA succeeded to undermine the dominance of the female inheritance. And we started looking how this could be done and um, the finding that you see there is the following, that uh, we managed to follow the sperm mitochondria in the fertilized egg. And what we observed is that when the egg started dividing, the sperm's mitochondria, which are only five, and that really, of course, helps a lot, um, follow two distinct patterns, and there is nothing in between. Either they will stay in the, se in the same cell, division after division, and we call this the aggregate pattern. That's like an E, isn't it? Like an E. E, e. e. This is a good example of that. E. On your. E, uh, yeah, e. this. Uh, yeah, I cannot e. quite see what column is. Yes, it is uh, the case um, in the the left side part uh, column where yeah. you see all the little and or they will be dispersed in um, in a random fashion, really. And then we had, of course, a way, and that was helpful too, <coughs> that we knew uh, that the eggs that followed the aggregate pattern, aggregate mitochondrial DNA pattern to be exact, um, were coming from mothers that produced only sons. And the dispersed pattern was coming from mothers that produced only daughters. So immediately we had a connection that if the aggregation pattern is of uh, is um, sorry, if the pattern is ag of the aggregated type, this embryo will develop into a male. If it dispersed, it will develop into the female. 
So that that's kind of an interesting finding, one that really started um, digging on to, into the mechanism of uh, of the uh, of this biparental inheritance, and and I guess David and uh, Angel started from there, and that's a good step that we're discussing today. Yeah. So um, we could run forward to the experimental design um, thing. So. And left Terry explained you these different types of aggregated and dispersed patterns. And what 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 we wanted to do um, was to examine the proteome of eggs producing the dispersed pattern and eggs producing the aggregated pattern, simply to see if there were any molecular differences between them in terms of expression of proteins. Because if there if there were such differences, then it could give a clue as to the mechanism of dispersal or um, aggregation and essentially that is what we did and we did find a difference we found that um, there were differences between the proteomes of these different types so on the left is the female bias that's the dispersed pattern or on the right on the in the middle is the aggregated pattern so this just shows that we, we from a natural population we took um, four individuals of each type, we can disregard that the mix were intermediate, it's not so important. And we found proteome, proteome differences and you know, Angel um, worked with my colleague Ed to try to identify some of the proteins which had expression differences between those two types of um, eggs. So, for example, we could be looking perhaps for a protein, candidate protein, which was involved in keeping all the mitochondria together in an aggregate or causing them to disperse and that's really amazing really to think that the mitochondria after fertilization from the sperm just stick in a little group and make their way eventually in future to the the male gonads so it's really interesting to discover what the what the mechanism is I mean might have some you know, general fundamental consequences, which I think Lefteria has spoken about. And um, so that is that is that is essentially the experiment that we did. And um, maybe Angel could explain some of the work on the mass spec and protein identification. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So basically, what we follow, you know, is. Uh you know, a proteomic analysis based on uh, protein separation uh, uh, by two-dimensional electrophoresis gels. And then uh, the protein of interest, well, this is uh, those showing, showing, you know, difference between uh, different type of eggs uh, could be uh, identified using mass spectrometry, you know, methods. So, well, here it's, you know, in the slide, you know, uh, uh, you know, a general scheme about this kind of uh, uh, Quantitative uh, proteomics uh, experiments. Okay, so well, that's basically you know, uh, and essentially you know the experimental procedure you know we follow in this proteomic analysis. So first of all, protein separations for the different samples according to 2D gels. Uh, sorry, following you know a 2D gel approach, and then uh, the protein of interest were uh, tried to identify following you know mass spectrometry you know methods. Of course, you know working with unknown model organisms. So this is uh, an organism uh, with an unsequenced, you know, genome. It's more difficult because uh, in order to uh, to get, you know, protein identifications, you know, we, we haven't got any uh, genome to work with that. So we have to overcome, you know, this problem with with well with the help of a transkin top uh, analysis that uh, you know we did in 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 our lab for for another experiment. So yeah. So that's the complication to work with no model organisms, for example, you know, to say. So what was the big take-home message from your paper? What was your big finding? Um, I suppose, that, well, that, that the, as I explained the experimental design, um, a key fact, actually, is that um, um, the, the, the sex de we haven't mentioned sex determination and sex determination Lefteri and Ellen have done experiments crossing muscles and they've shown that sex ratio is dependent on the mother so 
this is obviously intimately tied up with the inheritance of the mitochondrial DNA. So something being dependent on the mother rather than the father suggests a maternal effect. So one of the predictions we tested was that there would be a maternal effect <coughs> reflected in the proteome. And that was sort of the basis, the starting point, really, for predicting that there should be differences between the proteomes of eggs destined to become female with a dispersed pattern and eggs destined after fertilization to become male with the aggregated pattern. And we found, we found differences, generalized differences, and really Anhels explained that um, we then proceeded to try to identify some proteins which, were, which had expression differences. And, well, other many other people, of course, are working in this area. And um, there had been previous reports that the, the um, proteasome, ubiquitin proteasome system, proteasome system might be involved in this mechanism. And in fact, we did find in our work some evidence of proteos, proteasome subunits differing in expression between the different types of uh, different types of egg. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that I, I suppose that was the, the main result of this particular paper, and it was interesting because it matched the it it sort of matched results obtained in a different organism, a clam, which also has du DUI. So it was nice that uh, studies on different organisms produced the same results. But um, it's early days, really, yet to to. We're still a long way, I think, from finding out the mechanism. I mean, I don't know if Lefteri probably has something to say about the about hmm. the problem of, of actually elucidating the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, the way I see it is that um, um, even now uh, people think, and or we think, that um, mitochondrial DNA inheritance is a rather simple thing. All that you need is to have a mechanism that will prevent the sperm mitochondria either getting in the egg or once it got in to be destroyed and then that's all because then the egg will be left only with the mother's mit uh, mitochondrial DNA and this will continue the generation after generation and that's that is what the picture is or we think it was but now we find out in muscles that um, it's not that simple now we realize that the mitochondrial DNA itself I think the M for sure, and perhaps the F, that is the fathers for sure, and perhaps the mothers as well, have their own saying through their uh, sequence of how they will be inherited. So the mitochondrial DNA of the father, it seems to me, has the information to dictate the way it will be inherited. So. The mitochondrial DNA, in a way, has an active way as to how it will be passed on to the next generation. And that is a kind of fascinating thing, because so far we thought that the mitochondrial DNA contains only the information for the, the um, uh, electron transport and, para and the production of energy in the cell. And now it appears that um, it may have uh, much more information than that. Well, not much more, but some very important information on itself. And we have to start looking, is it really a piece of DNA in the total mitochondrial DNA, which is not more than 18,000 bases? Is there any protein coding sequence? Or there are some elements that interact with some proteins in the egg and produce this effect? That is the aggregation of the mitochondria of the sperm or the dispersed pattern. And I think this work uh, really takes us one step closer to asking this question. We don't know yet what is the actual machinery, but at least we, we have a f an idea of what proteins are involved and we'll, how we'll start looking at this mechanism of how the male mitochondrial DNA is being transferred, inherited, and how it also is related to sex, because this is a fascinating connection here, which is 100% um, working. I mean, it is a correlation that is 100%, the perfect association between inheritance of the father's mitochondrial DNA and the sex of the embryo.
so to speak, maleness. Yeah, maleness. Was, and, sorry. Get, so go I, ahead. I was just going to say, Lefty, that, uh, you know, then I think there's another question, too, which we talked about, is that even if we know what the mechanism is, there's the question of why it occurs in this particular group of organisms. Yeah, that's a good so, point, yeah. So there's a, a mechanistic, obviously, problem, I suppose, which molecular biologists are interested in. But then I think the evolutionary biologists want to know why. And uh, I think we're quite a long way from that. Are we left, Eri? <laughs> uh, I think we have a very long way. There is a sim simplistic answer to that, that uh, it would happen among the millions of organisms. It will happen in one, and we were lucky to find that one. Or there are some more that we don't know. Um, my feeling is that uh, it will really depend on sex determination. And uh, I and Dave have a model of how sex is produced or inherited. And that mechanism somehow makes it easier for some other mechanism, small developmental tricks or molecular tricks to develop and produce this um, uh, co-inheritance of the male mitochondrial DNA. So as the embryo is becoming, is destined to become male, so the M mitochondrion, uh, M mitochondrial DNA is destined to follow this maleness thing, and and that might, but that's one way of seeing it, really. All right, so I don't, not, we don't have any questions coming in right now. So I guess, yeah, we sort of have a big sort of sum up question from us is you know. And I think you guys touched on this a little bit about sort of the why, but you know, for other organisms, for higher organisms, for humans, disease purposes, you know, what sort of the the big sort of future direction for this research and for the field studying mitochondrial inheritance and how it relates to both evolution and sort of the function of the mitochondrial genome? Oh yeah, that is a big big question. <laughs> Yeah. I think that um, I feel that this type of inheritance is, is something unusual and particularly in evolutionary biology you can make progress by, by studying exceptions and uh, I just see it as, as, as perhaps we will discover something really interesting and new by looking at this mechanism and, and that's the justification whether it has any practical consequences for humans, I, I, I honestly don't know at the moment. What do you feel left, yeah. and how? I, I think, I think well, it would I be think right, totally, yeah. <laughs> totally premature to say that this thing can be of any immediate um, use in, um, in medical genetics or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the evolutionary questions are more, so to speak, closer to getting an answer. Uh, however, um, another area where we can make progress using this exceptional model is to ask um, how the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA have evolved over the millions of years. Because what's happening here is you have two mitochondrial DNAs, the maternal and the paternal, which are quite different, as a matter of fact, at least in um, um, primary DNA sequence, and um, they they seem to have no problem at all collaborating with the same genome, or the other way around. The same genome can collaborate with two entirely different mitochondrial DNAs. So how that is happening and why it does happen is, uh, is an interesting question, because uh, that might uh, unravel the interactions between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA, about which we don't really know too much these days. What about you saying, David? And how do you have anything to add? Well, and well yeah, I think it's, well, the, the main point is, you know, is one of the first time that really, for example, you know, the sperm cells, you know, uh, has got, you know, the mitochondrial coming from the father. So is, uh, a, a, you know, a good way, and from the evolutionary point of view, is good that, you know, the paternal, you know, mitochondrial DNA is under uh, evolutionary, well, under uh, natural se or selective, you know, pressures. Because, well, the mitochondrial, you know, is acting, you know, itself in the sperm cells, you know. So, 
should be under uh, certain selective genome pressures. It's not uh, uh, an end, you know, for, for the paternal genome mitochondrial DNA, but they continue, you know, through the uh, male progeny. So I think it's, it's good to know why. Cool. It's not. It's not impossible to think that something could be discovered which could have Im some implications for things like assisted reproduction or uh, or, or curing um, my, uh, inherited diseases due to defects in the mitochondrial DNA. We don't know, as Left Airy says, it's premature. But you don't know. Right. And the other thing that it might help. Now, this is a, of course this is a long shot. Um, it is obvious that um, the mitochondrial DNA, I mean ours, um, decays um, rather quickly. Uh, we have this phenomenon called uh, mutation meltdown. Um, it accumulates deleterious mutations and it cannot get rid of those because it does not recombine. And this is a well known um, case today. We know that if a DNA does not recombine, then it accumulates mutations, uh, bad mutations, of course, most of the time, and it gets um, it gets really useless. Uh, a primary example is the Y chromosome of uh, of mammals. Uh, now, uh, in our system, we have <laughs> yes, in our system we have uh, the M mitochondrial DNA, the paternal one, which we know it really evolves faster, and if it evolves faster, it means probably that it accumulates at a much higher rate than the, mater the, the maternal deleterious mutation. So this phenomenon of how the mitochondrial DNA decays and, and then you have a kind of a continuous um, replacement, a kind of a transition, trans transient polymorphism, and the old ones are disappearing from the population, new ones coming in and so on. Um, this is an interesting phenomenon, and I should remind you, well, from whatever little I know, that uh, the problem with Dolly, who died early, is because of accumulation of mitochondrial DNA mutations. Now, that might be a long shot, I might be wrong here. David, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I can't, with Dolly, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you're right. Accumulation of mitochondrial damage is is important. Yes. Great. So we have a yeah. Then we have a model here. We have the molecule which really accumulates faster mutations, and we can compare this and follow the mechanism of of how the mitochondrial DNA decays in time. Great. Well, this has been a great discussion, and I know Raj and I both very much enjoyed it, and hopefully all of you out there have enjoyed uh, getting our authors from other continents far, far away from us uh, to, to participate today. Uh, we, we do these journal clubs regularly, so please keep following us on ASBMB.org to see updates on when the next one will be. Um, we just want to thank our authors uh, one last time for getting through the techn technical difficulties and being able to sign on and having a great discussion. And so with that, we will say thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.